So I have been looking forward to talking to Sally Hodel, author of Destined to Die Young, a book uh, looking back on the king, Elvis Aaron Presley, who, uh, you know, was 44 years ago last week that uh, he passed away. And uh, you were in Memphis for the Elvis Week celebration, were you not, Sally? I was. I was in Memphis for eight days. Wow. And, you know, it was a, a little smaller gathering than usual just because of COVID and because oh, the international yeah. the international crowd couldn't come. And, you know, that's a big portion of the people that, that go to Elvis Week because he is still, you know, universal without right. question. No kidding. Uh, but, yeah, it was a great experience. It was my first Elvis Week, and it was a lot of fun. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's that's surprising, actually. I was... Well, you know, I've been to Memphis a dozen times to research, right, and to interview and all right. of that, but you can't do any of that during Elvis week because everybody's busy. So um, it always right. seemed like I should go at a slow time of year. So I, I was I was pleasantly surprised. The candlelight vigil, you know, where 10,000 people pass by his grave and it takes from <laughs> eight o'clock at night till one in the morning. I, it really is something to see. <laughs> Who else do they do that for, you know? Right. It's, incredible that is incredible i loved also uh in the book uh destined to die young as uh you wrote all historical figures have had the burden of judgment from future generations placed upon them but uh you know history after all is the story of humans and humans are flawed the greatest people in american history have had flaws that must be looked past or momentarily set aside by the uh, future generations and otherwise the greatness of those individuals will be lost. And I, I mean, that's what's happened to Elvis really, right? I mean, many people think of Elvis, they just think of the self-destruction and not yep. what he was. I mean, this iconic figure, I don't know that anyone will ever be that again. Yeah. It'd be hard to top, wouldn't it? And I, and I, there's just so much truth in that, you know, I love history and, and I think, so many of these great people have done things first and with innovation, you know, that it, it's hard to be first. And I think we kind of right. take that for granted now. It's hard to be different. Um, it was hard for Washington and Jefferson and Ford and, you know, all the people that I mentioned in my book where we kind of look at their negatives instead of their contributions. Right. Uh, but certainly with Elvis, it was very difficult to be as different as Elvis was. And, you know, it all came with the onset of TV, you know, without that timing of television, uh, Elvis wouldn't have been what he was either because he definitely had to be seen and heard, you know, because right. uh, he was that radical for 1956 America without question. Uh, but yeah, I think too many young people probably know the location of Elvis's death, you know, what room in the house he died in sure. and about the medication problem. And they don't know about how he culturally shifted not only American culture, but music around the world. You know, by the time Elvis gets to the UK, John Lennon is saying things like, before Elvis, there was nothing. And right. when you think about well, how little young people know about his contribution, you know, I, I think that's that's a tragedy. No kidding. Um, you know, I've been, uh, you know, an Elvis fan forever. In fact, I mean, my oldest son um, is named Elvis. So, uh, you know, I've been kind oh. of a fan, uh, kind of a fan <laughs> for a, a number awesome. of years. And so uh, I just, uh, I really look forward to reading your book. And I loved the, I mean, it was incredible. And you made a great case uh, for the destined to die young. Uh, how long, how long did it take you to uh, investigate everything? It was a four year process from oh. the, the idea to actually holding the book in my hand. You know, that last six months of layout, editing, design, print, all of that is in some ways the hardest, oddly. Um, right. But yeah, it was about a four year period. So let's go back to the beginning. I mean, let's go back to what everybody thinks they know. Um, you know, Elvis uh, over medicates, addicted to drugs dies in the bathroom right dies yeah. on the toilet and this this that's what he was uh yeah. you know I, I need another nanner sandwich and exactly. uh you know that's <laughs> that's what is perceived right but mm -hmm. perception isn't always the truth is it and it, and it never is through the lens of sensationalism <laughs> and i think elvis <laughs> is i think elvis is the biggest victim of sensationalism yeah in american culture ever uh, there is just so much untruth, so much, you know, it's it's cheeseburgers and women, right? It's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, it's the medication. And, uh, you know, I say a lot that 
Elvis is recognizable around the world by his image and by his first name. And there's not a lot of people you can say that about. And 44 years after they pass on top of it. So he's really as recognizable as Coca-Cola and Mickey Mouse. But Elvis was a real person. And when you take away that sensationalism, you can see his humanity. And when you look at his humanity, you know, whether it's through these health issues like I did, um, you can really his story is so much deeper and more profound than it ever was on its own. And it was already a great story. But when you really understand his poverty and then the level of fame he had that had never been experienced before and then the health ailments, you know, his story is not one of self-destruction. It is clearly a futile struggle to survive through a lot of struggle. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, as we go back, uh, he I was really surprised and I know an awful lot about Elvis, or at least I thought I did. And then I read your book and realized I didn't know an awful lot. Um, I was really surprised at the struggles he had uh, physically uh, mm-hmm. throughout his life that uh, he kept obviously hidden. I mean, he didn't want to, uh, you know, he's not bothering uh, the screaming girls at the stage level of, no, not tonight. Uh, my back right. hurts. Uh, you know, my <laughs> neck hurts. I can't, my stomach hurts. I can't right now. Uh, that's not going to happen. Right. I mean, yeah. he's Elvis. It's not going to happen, right. which is, was part of the struggle, right? He has to continue to be Elvis all the time. And, and no one can do it for him. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, a little bit of the history leading up to what we know was wrong with him. I mean, there was sure. a family tree that uh, was pretty devastating. It is. So by the time Elvis dies in 1977, he has disease or disorder in nine of the 11 systems of the body. Again, lifelong fan as well. Every book would mention them in just a little blurb, you know, a few right. sentences. And I'd think geriatric diseases for a 38 year old man. That's odd. And, yeah. but, you know, it just gets easily dismissed as the end result of the prescription medication problem. So, what my research showed is that of those nine, five of them have absolute evidence that they were present prior to fame and most likely since birth. So, wow. a lot of genetic issues. Um, And then looking at that even further, the reason for that is that Elvis's maternal grandparents were first cousins. So again, that doubling of the gene pool, we see this, these issues with his mother, you know, and that relationship between Elvis and his mother for fans like us, we know that that relationship has been romanticized over time forever. And Elvis died wanting to be with his mother. He died at a similar age, wanting to be like his mother. And these are romanticized ideas that don't hold up when you really apply when you really look at, you know, the big scope of his life. Right. Um, but it's, she had similar health issues and three of her brothers die in a similar way. So it all adds up, you know, Gladys is 46 when she passes. She has a brother who's 46, a brother who's 48, a brother who's 58, Elvis is 42, all heart, liver, lung related issues. And at that point, it just stops being a coincidence, right? There's something else yeah. going on there. So. And for sure, uh, these relatives didn't lead the life that Elvis led. Right. They weren't pushing themselves to be productive members of society, uh, you know, out in front of the public uh, doing what he did. They weren't on three week tours. You know, they weren't doing 60, 60 shows in 30 days in Las Vegas. Um, And yet they still they still met an early demise. And that was kind of the launch pad for me. You know, as a lifelong fan, I always wondered, why does why do Elvis and his mother die in a similar way? a similar four-year pattern of degenerative health and a similar age. She didn't take the medication. She wasn't a rock star. You know, there has to be a correlation there. And then when you see three brothers also meeting a similar demise, you know, again, I, I just had to investigate and I had to research. You know, I am a journalist. This was a crossroads of personal and professional <laughs> endeavor for sure. Uh, but I really... <laughs> I really did think it was going to just be kind of a brain candy project. And then there right. was so much evidence that it, it turned into a real bona fide project. And it's been incredibly rewarding. I was really surprised at how much, I was really surprised at how much the people around him knew and kept it secret yes. uh, for so, for so long. Uh, it seemed like that evidence would come out before now. And yet, no. I, I was surprised. And one of my big aha moments was how, how much they knew, but also how little. You know, no one knows the whole picture at any given time. You know, the Memphis Mafia guys are his employees. They're also his friends. And that's right. a delicate line. He is it their sure boss. Is. He doesn't want to appear 
week. So the Memphis Mafia guys know about a lot of his issues and they see him taking a lot of the pills and they don't know how sick he is. Like really his doctor and his nurse, you know, they were the ones who really knew the ailments that Elvis suffered from. But at one point in my research, yeah, I'm reading Sonny West's book and he was there almost all the time. You know, right, he was there very right. early on and very late to Elvis's career. And he says, you know, when Elvis goes to the hospital, in 75 they said it was a poor liver biopsy biopsy but it was really because of the drugs and he was taking too much and he had to go in and get clean so then i start researching it and elvis really did have a liver biopsy it's there are there's <laughs> right. testimony after testimony of that liver biopsy and the results of it and the other you know every time elvis goes into the hospital he leaves having like five more ailments than he went in with because <laughs> they're identified um, so even someone as close to him as Sonny West, the Memphis Mafia member, did not know what was going on. And the other thing that really surprised me was how much privacy there was about health back then, not just with Elvis, but with everyone. So when, right. when Gladys was in the hospital in 1957, and I was privileged to talk to Barbara Hearn Smith, one of Elvis's first girlfriends, when he's famous, you know, first famous there in 56, 57. And she was very close with Gladys. She lived in Memphis. So she'd spent a lot of time with her when Elvis was out touring. And she was with Gladys during the two-week hospital stay in 1957. So I thought, surely Barbara is going to be a wealth of information. I sit down right. with Barbara and I say, so what was wrong with Gladys for two weeks in the hospital? Right, what's going on? 1957. And Barbara says, oh, we never would have asked that in 1957. I, I went there every day for two weeks. I never asked her why she was in the hospital. You would never talk about that. And you That's would so never weird. ask that question because of privacy. Like people were just much more private about health. And, and a lot of things back then. It just wasn't proper to talk about it, you know, but it is weird. And right. she had no information on why she was there. She just went to visit and keep her company. That is really strange. And it we is. see we see now that uh, the doc, uh, his main doctor, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I realized that he had several helping right. him yes. out uh, throughout the country. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had, uh, you know, his main doc and friend, again, someone yeah. that was in the inner circle who was uh, still you know, caring for his friend, knowing so much. I mean, that was the guy that knew what was happening, right? I mean, he knew that there was issues, that there were issues that needed to be addressed, and he was really trying to make that happen and keep it private. Yeah, and keep and walk that delicate line when that line is blurred between physician and friend. You know, that's difficult in any Sure. <laughs> Any yeah, yeah. doctor patient relationship, if you are related to your doctor or you're friends with your doctor. Yeah. So certainly when you have the most, you know, recognizable man on the planet as your patient. Um, and it's hard for Dr. Nick because he understands not only that Elvis sometimes takes too much, you know, the prescription medication did become a problem. I don't sugarcoat that. Um, so he, he's trying to help with that problem, but he also understands that Elvis has these ailments, some of which he can't identify. And he wants Elvis to go places and have like long-term studies and testing done. Right. Elvis doesn't want to do that. Um, and a lot of these things, like we know now that Elvis had this immune system disorder. Well, we also know how hard it is to get that diagnosed in today's world. Right. Where we are well aware of immune system disorder. They never would have been able to probably figure that out in 1975, 1970, you right. know, America. So there were things that, that Dr. Nick probably couldn't have helped with, even if he did, you know, uh, have a fully cooperating patient and at times he did not but yeah he was he was in it over his head like, without question right one of the things that I, I another thing that i really enjoyed about the book is your uh layout of his schedule um mm -hmm. you know he was you don't you don't think of this guy as you know working like he did i yep. mean the guy was a hard <laughs> guy was never ending work He's a workaholic and we yeah. know so much about Elvis as the glutton, right? That's the right. sensationalized idea that he's just out there buying cars and giving them away. That's all he ever right. does. That's all he's doing and, is stay at home and eating, hanging out, doing yeah. drugs. And, yeah, that's it. That's all Elvis does. And the truth, the reality is, is that he worked very hard, very hard. And especially in the seventies, you know, we see like some people like to complain about the movie years, but I think they might've extended his life because he ends it's up hospitalized. Down. Right. They end up, he ends up hospitalized in the 1950s when he's touring on that rigorous schedule because his body can't handle it. And then the movie years, he does pretty well. But then when he starts touring, 69, 70, you know, by 73, he's in the hospital. He's in the hospital twice in 75. And each year he's right. booking more shows. You know, it's not like he slows down through those health ailments. He's booking more and more shows. So he he absolutely was a workaholic. We also know that he, you know, he made such a leap 
financially in one year in 1956 that would have taken most families four or five generations sure. probably it was life uh, life altering right they they didn't understand the money they had they didn't know how to right. control it or invest it or any of those things and his dad who has between a third and fifth grade education is his business manager accountant you know um so elvis spends a lot of money and we know that too and that is also correlated sometimes to how much he has to work because he has to make more to spend more because uh, right. he does give so much away and it uh, it makes sense that he would want to have his friends, the people who were in his circle, enjoy the same thing that he's enjoying, right? He he pulled them out of poverty with right. him, and and it's amazing. Like just exploring his health, I came to understand Elvis in such a different way. And I I say in one of those chapters that. You know, if it's not his relationship with his mother that leads us to understanding who Elvis was, it's his relationship with poverty. And yeah. that thread is throughout his story. And it, it's just amazing once you see it pieced together, because it does impact every decision he ever makes. It's why he makes so many movies that he doesn't really want to make. It's hard for a kid who had nothing to turn down a million dollars for a film right. he's not excited about. Um, and you see it with the people in his life, because I always say too, like how many rock stars take women home to meet grandma, you know, uh, right. <laughs> his grandmother lived at his house. His grandmother lived at Graceland all along. His parents had lived there before Gladys died. And when she dies and Vernon remarries, they buy a house right behind Graceland. There are aunts and uncles who are employed at Graceland and who live on the grounds, many at any given time. And then many of the Memphis mafia and their family as well. So he had a lot of people relying on him and consciously or subconsciously, he knew that he pulled all of those people out of guy. poverty. Right. And he knew he had to keep him there too. Yeah, absolutely. And that was a lot of pressure. That was a lot of pressure. That was the drive. I mean, no matter mm -hmm. what. And so when absolutely. he's sitting home resting from being in the hospital and trying to get his head straight and his body straight, he knows he's got to get back to it. He's got to. And he doesn't feel good. And he says it. He says it. You know, everybody, everybody talks about it. He'd be really great, healthy, straight as an arrow at the beginning of the tour, a week in. He's not doing good again, you know, because the Turing is that hard on someone who has hypogammaglobulinemia, which means his body can't fight infection. So he's getting colds and flus, you know, all the time because it and then he lives at night. Right. Because he's so famous. Right. So, you know, he has vitamin D deficiency. So that that immune system was not working like it should. And that was just one aspect, you know, that made it very difficult to be. Let's go down. Wrestling. In fact, go down the list of what was what was wrong with the man. I mean, it's, it's sure. incredible. It is incredible. You know, we know he had a heart issue and right. it's hard to say exactly what that is. Obviously he dies of cardiac arrhythmia. That's the official, you know, diagnosis decision. And we know that Gladys died. And by the way, issue. and by the way, just, I want to pause for just a moment there with the, uh, he had a heart issue and that's what he died of. I know that, you know, we love hearing that he was dying. He died out sitting on the toilet and uh, you know, that was it. But actually the actual documentation was is that he was up and trying to get out of the bathroom, right? So right, that's what, right. where we get the, uh, the the knowledge that it was a hard event yes, because was he was quick. like, holy crap, I got to, what's going uh, on? Grab your right. chest, right? And fall, yes. And in a drug-related death, he would have slumbered on the bathroom floor that, for many he hours. Would, he would have actually been just sitting there, I would yes. right. Yes. I'm sorry. So, but... yeah. So the heart issue is correlated to the colon problem and the liver issue that he has. But, you know, the colon problem has long been written off. He had a megacolon. It was much worse than they ever thought it was. And they didn't realize how bad it was till autopsy because they just had an X-ray. They didn't have CT scan and MRI and all those kinds of things. And they um, joked about it when he was a kid. Uh, the, his friends joked about him uh, being yeah. backed up all the time. Yeah. So that was one of the big ones for me yeah. because, you know, it's always just set aside. I mean, Dr. Oz did a show a few weeks ago and said the colon problem was all because of the opiates because it slows down your digestive system. It's like we have a guy who lived with him in Lauderdale courts in high school saying he was always constipated. Right. And now from my research, we have Annie Presley, who was besties, you know, with Gladys saying that Gladys was constantly trying to get a baby and toddler and young Elvis to achieve a bowel movement. So it was a huge lifelong problem, most right. likely genetic. And we know it runs through the Presley family, too, from my research. Um, but that heart problem with the colon problem and the fact that he dies in the bathroom, again, you take away the sensationalism of that and you're left with, you know, the Valsalva maneuver, which is any kind of straining, which you do during childbirth or scuba diving, right. you know, it changes the pressure between your heart and your blood pressure, and it can create this cardiac arrhythmia. 
And we know from Dr. Nick's testimony that before a tour, Elvis would be straining extra hard to empty his bowels so that he wouldn't look so bloated on stage. And he was scheduled to go on tour the next day. So that cardiac arrhythmia, again, within this health context, it makes more sense when you're not just focused on the drugs, right? Right. Um, so uh, he also was a carrier for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and that is a disease which affects your lungs or your liver. Again, depending if you get one bad gene or two. So that's why Gladys had the liver issue. And, you know, Elvis was thought was diagnosed with COPD at one point. Um, and we see him doing inhalers and things before he goes on stage in the 70s. Yeah. You know, again, now it makes more sense. Toward the um, end, he was doing, he was uh, going between songs for oxygen, right? We know that. Yeah, because so not only does he have this lung disorder, this genetic lung issue, but the megacolon starts to, it gets so bad, it's pushing up in his chest cavity and he can't breathe. Can't breathe. So the amazing, you know, the fact that he's saying like he did to Barry end really is, again, a testament to his work ethic and his dedication because right. it's pretty amazing. Uh, his nervous system, we know he was a lifelong insomniac. Again, only a few reasons for that in a young person. And he had insomnia from the time he was a young right. teen. Um, and it becomes the hardest thing to treat, but it also becomes the first thing he treats because being an insomniac before he was famous was doable. You take a nap after work, you know, uh, but being an insomniac as Elvis Presley was not doable. No and kidding. this is a time long before Ambien and Lunesta. So Dr. Nick is using things like Valium and other tranquilizers, strong tranquilizers to achieve sleep with Elvis. And all these things have addiction issues and tolerance levels, but he could not sleep without them. They tried you know, they tried to achieve sleep multiple times, multiple, multiple times. times. And I, I love the one. I mean, they even did this. Uh, the one study when he came back from the hospital and was, you know, clean and they were trying to, you know, make him yeah. healthy. And the doc was like, just don't do anything. Go until you sleep. Yeah. You know, yeah. Three days later, <laughs> three days later, it's like, OK, dude, well, we got to do something. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and in our American culture, like if you can get by in two or three hours of sleep, everybody thinks that's great, you know, right. but it's not healthy and it's not normal. And when you can't achieve sleep like that at all without medication, it is a nervous system disorder oh, without question, it. without question. Um, he had endocrine system. He had severe problems with his adrenal glands because through his you know, immune system issue, he would complain all the time about pain throughout his whole body. Now, I think we understand that that's probably arthritis. He was diagnosed with arthritis, but we know that that's probably caused from the inflammation associated with oh, the true. immune system problem. And he would have pain throughout his whole body. People around him thought he was making it up for more medication. Right. But we know now more about immune system problems and how that does create- and He's only on stage moving, singing and dancing, you know, for his entire life. Right, yeah. So, but the arthritis is the muscular and skeletal right. system issues. And when you're, you know, when you talk about him on stage, since I researched and wrote this book, I look at all the concerts so differently. You know, Aloha. I know. Like he watched the 68 special and his eyes are open all the time. In 70, 73, he does Aloha and his eyes are closed for most of that performance because the glaucoma, which he has, which is also very strange for a young person, right, um, is becoming a real problem. So he keeps his eyes closed a lot. He doesn't move a lot in that show. Incredible. And a few months later, he has his first hospital stay uh, versus, you know, Elvis, the way it is, the documentary special, I believe that was 71 or 70 or 71. Um, he is like the most serious karate movements you can imagine. Yeah. Yet also at the same time, as you know, from the book, he writes a TCB oath, which is a lot of karate driven goals that he has. But then he says freedom from constipation. So to know that he was in pain and uncomfortable and it had a lifelong problem with right. that, it could still move like that on stage. I, yeah. You have to have some pain to do that. <laughs> yeah. Hello. You have to. You'd have to. Yes, absolutely. And one of the things that I, I enjoyed too uh, in the book, and uh, I'm not, uh, by far, we're not even close to giving it all away. It's well worth the read, uh, Destined to Die Young. I, I absolutely loved it. Um, one of the things that uh, I loved was uh, the one photographer who had followed him uh, for hundreds of shows and uh, thousands of pictures, um, really looking back and knowing then when it was going to be a good show and when it wasn't going to be a good show by the puffiness of his hands when he was taking yeah. the photos. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. That's incredible. Cause again, immune system right. issues, right? Your body's swelling, you know, he has this megacolon. So his whole body is just kind of a toxic place. Yeah. One doctor I was consulting with said he was a ticking time bomb. Like there are three things that could kill him at any time. You right. know, the colon being one of them because it could just become toxic and spread and get sepsis and kill you. Um, 
but yeah, and you'd be surprised. I heard that more than once. So that Larry Strickland, who was one of the background singers, um, I just, you know, messaged him and said, do you have anything to add? This is the topic. I know a lot of people were kind of nervous about the topic of this book when you try to explain that was his death. And I understood that going into right. it. Uh, but he said, I can't really think of anything other than um, his, when his hands were swollen, the sh I knew the show wasn't going to be as good as it could have been. You know, like he noticed the swelling Amazing. of his hands too. So really interesting, such a small thing, but we now know it meant a lot. Yeah, no kidding. Um, Sally Hodo, uh, Destined to Die Young, uh, a book on Elvis Presley, incredible story. Um, I'm sure that uh, has this been... Is this now part of the Elvis entourage world or are you still on the outside looking in? Uh, well, when I was in Memphis, you know, it's pretty incredible to have people who knew Elvis be like, Sally, and give me a hug, you know, and, nice. okay. and there are a number of people who knew Elvis that I've had that feedback from, which is incredible to hear. Uh, you know, one Memphis Mafia guy said, I wish I would have known this then. And another right. person said, you know, I wish... Um, obviously I wish I would have known it, but I think he really nailed it. Like Elvis is a really hard person to, to describe and to capture. And you did through this lens of his health issues. So to hear that from people who knew Elvis is pretty incredible, but yeah, I still see it as it's been very successful. I, you know, the right. book is being read around the world and that's right. incredible, but it, I do see it as a grassroots movement, you know, so to speak to uh, have Elvis be more understood because as any historical figure, they deserve it. They contributed Absolutely. to our world and to our country and did something incredible and, and their humanity deserves a, you know, to be understood. One of, one of my favorite things about Elvis, uh, as far as being this global icon is that, uh, you know, he rarely left the United States of America. I think he did a couple of shows in Canada and pretty much it. And yet the guy is a global icon. Uh, you could never get away with that today. I mean, we no. wouldn't have to, and, and some people, you know, you, you can actually with the internet make it happen. Uh, with, you know, it's a different kind of stardom than what he had. But, uh, you know, it's pretty incredible that uh, the guy is such a global icon and a light that was just USA. It's, it's amazing. He is Americana the world over. Yeah. And he definitely lives on. And the uh, passion that people in other countries have for him, I think Americans can learn a lot from. Uh, <laughs> and, and especially, I say, young Americans, because it, just like history and everything else, it is our job to pass that on to younger generations. And we, and we need to do that. He was important, you know, culturally. I don't know if there's anyone more important. So, so that legacy needs to be passed on without question. Absolutely. Sally Holder, thank you very much. I appreciate you joining me on Chewing the Fat today. It's great. Absolutely. Fun, fun talking with you.